I'll give a few minutes to see if anyone is actually. Okay. And so, our, our closed captioning is working now. Oh, okay. cool. I will mention that too. That does, it, it does do it. No one up, look at that. Okay. So thank you, Athena. Lindsay, are you ready? Yes. Okay. So on December 1st, 2020 at 2 02 PM, seeing a quorum of the committee present, I am calling the community resources committee of the town council to order governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, MGL chapter 30A section 20 allows us to hold this virtual meeting of the CRC. Yes. The meeting is being recorded for future broadcasts and any votes taken will be by roll call. Um, let me mute everyone here. And we do have closed captioning working for those who want to do that. I believe you just have to set it up at the bottom of your screen um, if you are connected by Zoom. So at this time, I'm gonna call upon each committee member by name and to confirm that you can hear me and we can hear you, please remember to mute your mic after saying present. Um, first, I'm gonna call on the ones that are not here, which is Shalini Balmilne, who will not join the meeting today at all, and Sarah Swartz, who will join the meeting later. So she will not be here for the first about half hour. Um, and then that leaves me, who is present, Mandy Johanneke and Evan Ross. Present. And Steve Schreiber. Thank you. Um, with that, we will move to our first order of business, which is minutes. Um, we do not have the November 4, 2020 minutes from the joint meeting yet. I will work on getting them as soon as I can. So we are looking at only the November 17, 2020 minutes. Are there any changes to those minutes? Evan is shaking his head and Steve is shaking his head. So with that, I will make the motion to adopt the November 17, 2020 minutes as presented. Is there a second? Second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, we'll take our roll call vote. Mandy is a yes. Evan? Yes. And Steve? Yes. They are adopted three to zero with two absent. And uh, which allows us to move directly into our first item of business, which is I listed as an action item this time, zoning priorities recommendation. We're continuing our discussion, um, but I'm hopeful, and it might be a little bit too hopeful at this point that maybe we could get to a, a vote of some sort to make a recommendation to the town council on this. We did take a preliminary sort of assessment on the items that have to go for consulting um, and where the CRC stood on those last week. Um, and so I wanna concentrate this week on the non-consulting items to think about what our recommendation to the council would be to ask the town manager to prioritize um, in terms of staff time and all of that over the next, we can look at it three months, six months, a year, Beyond, um, we can pretty much craft any motion we want, but that's the discussion I want to have today. Um, you know, and so I think Ben is Ben was here. Ben is still here. <laughs> I was like, Ben is here, and you still have here. the most the most up to date chart, I believe. Um, I have one in the packet um, that you forwarded after the meeting two weeks ago. Um, yep. I don't know whether any changes have been done to it. Um, no changes. No. Do you want to share that or do you want me to share that? Um, yeah, if you wouldn't mind. Do you have it up? I, I can uh... I, I can do it if that would okay. be um I just have to pull it up. So let me pull that up and then find my share button here. Okay, so and I will make it bigger. So this is one that has a second, an extra column. Well, I don't know whether there's an extra column here, but there was something that was forgotten on the last ones Yeah. added. Um, can you remind me what that was then? Yeah, um, it was the small cell 5G regulations. That, that was something that was included on the first uh, table. And then 
it was somehow lost in the shuffle when I reformatted it, but um, something I wanted to make sure got back into the table um, as it's a priority of the planning department and something we've taken a look at already. So uh, it's down, yeah, down at the bottom there. Okay. And, and I heard just before this meeting today um, from Athena that you were asking that about um, the demolition delay bylaw and that that's pretty much ready to to come to council and planning board. Um, I, I did I did inquire with Athena, yeah. Um, but I would say it's it's more like two months out um, oh. from being ready. But I, I just wanted to uh, get a preliminary sense from her of what it what the process would entail. Okay. So let's start with a conversation on. Um, I, I mean, how are we going to prioritize these or how, what in terms of the town council request to the town manager, what should our recommendation be? And so the first question I think we have to answer is we have a beautiful chart here that indicates town council planning board and planning department priorities. Um, should we really be just discussing the town council side of that? Um, to, to give an idea to the planning board and planning department what the town council wants as priorities while um, recognizing that the planning department has its own priorities that it will be addressing in due course or do we want to try and when we send a recommendation to the council do um, a comprehensive recommendation that takes it all into consideration and includes those items that the planning department has um, and is working on and how to priorities that, you know, I, I'm, I'm mainly thinking about the ones that didn't show up anywhere else, like demo delay, flood maps, you know, things like that, that are going to happen, um, you know, and do we want to put that in or acknowledge it somehow while also creating other priorities or listing other priorities? So thoughts on that. And there are only three of us. So Steve and Evan, Evan never minds talking, but Steve, you're not going to get out of talking this time. And while there's only three of us, I'm just going to say, just chime in. Don't bother raising a hand. So just unmute yourself and start talking. Does that apply to um, staff as well? It can apply to staff as well, Christine and Dave and Ben. Um. So I would like to chime in and say that I think that um, you as council members should focus on the priorities that you think are important and bring those to the um, town council with the understanding that there are other things and you might want to list them or we can list them that the planning department and the planning board will be working on simultaneously to the ones that the town council thinks are most important. That, that would be my recommendation. Thanks for that, Christine. That, that's going to be helpful. Evan, I see you unmuted, so. Yeah, so uh, I, I went back and forth on this um, in the three minutes since you asked it, um, but I think I, I agree. Um, obviously something like the flood maps is going to be a priority to um, the planning department, but even me with my background in water resources and hydrology is not, seeing the flood maps is my priority that I want to, you know, uh, push in the council. And so I think that the, if there are areas that we see our priorities overlap, I think it's worth bringing that into the conversation of like, look, this isn't just the priority of the CRC or of the council, but actually a shared priority across bodies. But I don't necessarily feel like we should, um, list priorities as the council's priorities if they're only really uh, playing department priorities. And I also don't want us to constrain ourselves to only the priorities where we see, where we see um, shared identification as a priority across the three bodies. Because I think, you know, there are things in um, that, that maybe the counselors brought forward that there really is a big part of the council that identify that as a priority, but it might not rise to the surface as a priority for planning department or for planning board. But I don't think that means that we should 
pretend like it's not a priority for the council. So I, I would back up with what Christine said. Um, and then I have a couple of thoughts on timing, but uh, I can save those if Steve wants to talk about um, how we present first. And so really the goal here, it, it, we just chime in, right? Yep. And our goal is to say that this is what our group thinks should be the priority, then the town council takes our recommendation and they can do whatever they want with that. Yes, that's. Yeah, I, the way I see the motion at council being is council um, directing the manager, or I don't know whether the word would be direct, but it would be something to the town manager because that's what the council can do. Um, so whether it's asking or directing or informing you know, the manager that the council's zoning priorities for revision are as follows or something like that. Um, obviously the motion has not been drafted yet, but that's that's how I see it. It's not, it, it, it would be something directed towards the town manager. Yeah, so maybe consistent with what Evan is saying, like I, um, I don't think we wanna be known as the council that fixed the sign bylaw but the sign bylaw should be fixed. So I think that that can, should, can and should move ahead without it necessarily being a priority of us. But the, you know, the ones that I hear the most chatter, the, to me, the places of conflict and opportunity are like the BG zone, right? So unlocking BG, I think is critical. And that could be unlocking BG through the 40R proposal, it could be unlocking BG, through the addition of an asterisk or two, footnote A. Um, but I would think that that would be, I, I think that that particular area is something of interest to everybody. You know, everybody on the town council slash planning board slash planning staff. So, so those, that, that would be something. Um, if you mean the BL, right? Did you mean BL? I'm I meant BL, I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, BL. I'm sorry. Yeah, and then locking BG. No, I'm just joking. Um, well, at the same time, locking BG. Um, and uh, yeah. So what I'm hearing is that maybe this conversation needs to concentrate on those that under the source column have a TC next to them. Um, and potentially a PB planning board, um, but that we're going to, you know, based on Christine's recommendation and what I've heard from Evan and Steve, sort of the planning board priorities will continue to move at their pace with where they are. And then we're going to, through the town count, what the town council identified when it had the fir very first meeting on this and through our recommendation, try and identify those other priorities that the council wants to see the planning board work on for this council before this council leaves office in a year. Um, which also tells me we should be working and looking at things that are in the three to six month and maybe the six to 12 months, but not the 12 to 18 month section. Um, yeah, so can I speak to timing a bit? Sure. So I was thinking about, you know, this is a, a, a big matrix and there's a lot in here. Um, and I, I, so when I was preparing for this meeting, I was thinking about the timing, right? How, what, how are we going to do this? And, and we essentially have a year, right? More or less, we have one year. And I was thinking about the fact that um, the spring, if we're thinking, you know, predicting what the council is going to be consumed with, the early spring is likely to be largely consumed by discussions over the proposed library project. The early summer will be consumed by the budget into midsummer. Um, and so where I see the council having sort of the capacity to grapple with zoning is in early winter and late summer, early fall. And so that I guess feeds into what you just said, Mandy, which is we're probably looking at, if we're looking at what can we get done in the next year, we're probably looking at the really low hanging fruit 
And then the stuff that might take six months to develop that could come to us maybe in August. Um, and I'm wondering if you're saying, you know, how do we present this recommendation? If, if that would be a way to almost think about it and segment it, which is, you know, I think that there is some stuff, and I know this always seems overly optimistic when I say it, but I really do think that there is some stuff that could be written and sent to planning board in January. And then there's stuff that is going to take more time, but could probably be done by the summer. Um, and I can give you examples of what those are. And so I'm wondering if it makes sense to think about the priorities in sort of that two tiered approach is here's what we want to do pretty quickly to get our feet wet. And then here are the things that could be done that we wanted, we want to accomplish in the fall. Um, and that can help us think about the the size of the task and the timing. So may I ask a question? Yep. Evan, um, are you proposing that the town council or the CRC would actually write the text of the zoning bylaws that you want to see instituted? Or are you saying that you would um, state what your priorities are and turn over the tasks of writing the text to the planning department? So my thought is the latter. Um, I think that um, when it comes to sort of what I've described as the low hanging fruit, um, I think that some of those things in theory are, are fairly quick to write, but I do think that it's more appropriate for them. So let me give you just, let me just say this with examples, right? So for instance, um, if people are interested in um, issues of supplemental dwelling units, right? In theory, we could bring back the exact same bylaw that went before town meeting in 2018. It's, it's already written and maybe it could be tweaked, but that wouldn't take a lot to write. Steve just talked about unlocking the BL. He said 40R is one way to do it, although you've heard my opinions on using 40R as a way to fix the BL. But you know, the other option is you know, just adding the BL to, to footnote B and maybe adding footnote A to a couple of the dimensional regulations. That in my, in my mind, at least, doesn't take a long time to actually write that revision because it's just adding two letters to the BL footnote and maybe adding footnote A to say uh, maximum lot coverage and maximum building coverage. So that's what I'm talking about by the things that I think could literally be written like very soon. I'm not saying that we should write it. The ones that I think are a lot longer is I think what we heard some consensus on in this committee, and I, and I think that there's consensus on this in the council, um, is the idea of looking at lot sizes in some of the denser residential neighborhoods. Um, we talked about that quite a bit in our last, I think it was our last meeting. Um, and even I think uh, Councillor Pam brought it up in the TSO meeting recently about, I think it was in the TSO, but maybe it was in the retreat about having smaller lots being able to build that that to me is something where maybe there's consensus but it it takes a little bit more time because i think the question is how big of the lots how do you change setbacks how do you change frontage um and as i mentioned i think last time if you're going to change lot size in the rg that might also mean you want to look at do the boundaries of the rg make sense so, which is why i think to me that question even though i would love to just say make rg lots five thousand square feet um, I understand that there's there's more investigation there and there's more, which is why it's an, an eight month thing. And I think that it makes more sense for that to come from the expertise of the planning department than, you know, me and, and, and Shalini having coffee and saying, how big of a frontage do you think you need? And then Steve telling me why I'm wrong later on down the road, right? And so um, I think to me, it's the latter of us telling what our priorities are, but I, I, I think the text should always come from the planning department. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I'd be curious what my colleagues here thought. Yeah, so I guess with everything that you just said, I think some of it could potentially come from the counselors. I mean, Evan just set forth some. It, I think it's always better to come from the planning department or the planning board, those that deal with it more than us. Um, and, you know, but I also worry that some of those that are deemed, like Evan just said, will be thought of as sort of a be all end all to fixing those issues. Um, and, and I don't, you know, there, there's that, let's get something done, let's do it. But 
you know, as Evan said with 40R, that can't be the solution to fixing the BL because the underlying zoning is still bad. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know enough to say, is adding footnote A to a bunch of other dimensional regulations the solution? You know, if we were doing the whole thing, would that be the solution if we looked at it? It might be a good interim thing to get done now and soon, um, but I don't, I, I don't, and that's where I'd need the planning department to say, hey, this could work in the interim, but as we're looking at, say, you know, improve downtown zoning, footnote A might be deal with it now, get it done, and improve downtown zoning takes another year. We're not going to see that for a year and a half. 18 months of having footnote A there gives us time to figure out whether that's good or not and incorporate stuff like that into the sort of foolish or more full rewrite of figuring out downtown zoning. So that's what I worry about doing stuff quickly that is those what Evan calls the low hanging fruit of it then people think we're done and I'm not sure that finishes those items. Although I could be wrong since I'm not a zoning expert, maybe that is enough. <laughs> so that's that's my concern. Steve, do you have anything to add? Yeah, so the- but you, just, you just muted yourself. Yep, yep. I um, was tired of pushing down the space bar. Uh, so there's another approach to some of the things that Evan and others have been talking about, like frontage and lot size. So I think that lot size will be controversial. No matter where it is, it'll be controversial. The asterisk will be controversial. Um, there's another approach to this, which is uh -huh. to take things that now require a variance, which basically is an impossible standard, and move them certain things into the special permit category. So, so now things like frontage is not waivable you know it's not there's no provision in the bylaw other than a variance to um you know get a non-conforming well uh, there's uh, other legal ways but there's nothing in the zoning bylaw that allows say a 99 foot lot in the rg to be approved unless that meets the standards of a variance um, but you could move that into a special permit category to say that lot sizes frontages can be smaller by special permit and things that require now a special permit could be moved into the site plan review category. So that would be one way of incrementally dealing with some of the concerns that you have. But yeah, so that would unlock possibly, and especially if you said that within a range, like lot frontage must be this, but if it's within 10% of that, then it can be by special permit that it can be smaller than that, something like that. But that's an incremental way, a baby step of dealing with that. But moving, say, from 12,000 square foot required lot size to 5,000 square foot lot size will be such a jarring and dramatic change that the prospect of it ever passing and the prospect of getting buy-in from the community is, is difficult would be a very difficult sell. But the, this other approach might be a, a more reasonable sell. Particularly when you look at all those, say, um, 99 foot lots that are out there, which are actually a reasonable number of them, or 95 foot lots. So let's uh, possibly... talk about... You can finish. I agree with Steve in terms of some things can be done incrementally and have a really big impact. I think just um, one of the things that Evan mentioned before, which is to add the BL zone to footnote B would have a tremendous amount of impact because no longer would a certain amount of frontage or a certain amount of lot area be required per dwelling unit in the BL. And that's exactly what's preventing development of the BL. So um, that kind of incremental change could have a huge difference. And allowing um, certain things like uh, frontage to be varied or modified within a certain range, and I think 10% is reasonable, um, could also have a huge impact on properties that can't be developed now, but could be developed in the future. So that is not, um, it doesn't have a lot of shock value, um, but it could have a, a big potential impact. 
So I think what I want to do is talk about Evan's three to three month range. If there's anything we think, and this is where we'll need Chris and Dave and Ben and all to, to weigh in on, on possibilities. If we could get something done in the next three months or out to the council in the next three months for hearing, um, what would our priorities be? You want my opinion? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> I think adding the BL to footnote B should be one of the highest priorities, and it could be done really easily in terms of wording. And adding footnote A uh, for lot coverage and maximum building coverage would also be something that could be done very quickly. And the supplemental apartment is already written, so that could be done very quickly. Demolition delay bylaw could be done really quickly because it's probably 80% written already. And um, it may be a case that we want to actually remove it from the zoning bylaw and put it into the general bylaw. So that's something that we've been talking about as staff. Um, we think it belongs in the general bylaw instead of the zoning bylaw, but it would have to be a two-step process where you'd take it, you'd put it into the general bylaw and then take it out of zoning. But I think that could be pretty simple as long as the um, historical commission gets the wording down pat. So that's another one that could go really quickly, I think. So can I ask a question um, of Christine and them? Mm -hmm. I see the town council, a lot of people wanted to expand the types of housing permitted in town, both by location and permit type. Um, so in the BL or in the RG, um, and then as a SPR instead of a SP, special permit. Um, is that something that I, we've got three to six months on here? Is that something where we could add, you know, a, and I'm throwing something out here that probably we would never do, which is add apartments to RO. But, you know, um, um, but, but is that, you know, it, it seems like I, the planning department, the planning board all had it, various timeframes for a whole bunch of how in, Intensive we get with that and extensive we get with what we're doing, but is, a, is an expansion of duplexes, triplexes, multifamilies into areas that aren't currently allowed um, something that could be done in the next three months, similar to that adding footnote B is not that hard um, in terms of language. Is, is this something that is also not that difficult in terms of language? The difficulty is figuring out which ones you want where and whether it's a special permit or a site plan review. I think the wording of it's going to be pretty simple, but the um, impact of it is going to be high and you're gonna get a lot of pushback. So I think it's gonna be very controversial. For instance, Echo Hill, single family houses. Um, if you try to make duplexes allowed there or triplexes allowed, it's gonna be murder. <laughs> I'm just speaking because I live there and, uh, and I know, you know. So to me, it sounds like something that we might want to get language out there sooner rather than later, if that's something the council's serious about doing so that the conversations can start. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Evan? Um, yeah, so I guess what you're doing, Mandy Joe, which is sort of interesting, um, is looking at so one of the things we've noticed with this matrix is that some of these things are, are vague, right? Like need for housing and increased density could mean a million and a half different things. And so are there, again, I think what you're looking at is within some of these vague things where a lot of people wanted them, are there sort of small things that we can do? And, and I do think that's, um, you know, I, I think that if, if, if we did um, fix the BL, uh, SDUs and demo delay within the next like four months, that would be an incredible thing. But I also don't think it's bad to think of some of these other things um, um, around uh, increasing density, increasing housing types. And so, you know, the other ones that I'd be curious to look at that you sort of touched on um, regarding apartments um, are options, um, are other options too that could be simple to um, unlock apartments. And so, um, you know, one that might be, you know, controversial would be um, 
moving them from special permit to site plan review in some of these districts. I think they're only special permit in, I'd have to look at the dimensional regulations, but I think they're only special permit. I mean, they're only site plan review in the BG and in other areas where they're allowed their site plan review. So mm -hmm. that could be one option. Um, and the other one that would be really simple, I don't know if it would be controversial or not, I hope it wouldn't be, would be um, rescinding footnote M which that would be a really simple one to write because you're just removing something. You don't have to actually produce any text, um, but would at least um, impact, could, could have an impact on apartment development. Yeah, removing footnote M would be huge. That would be very good. Right, I mean, that, that's one where we actually, it's, I think it's the only one where you don't have to write anything because it would just be a remove, like we could literally have a hearing on that like soon because it's, we don't have to produce anything. It's just removing something and it could have a pretty significant impact on apartment development. So I think that the apartment development is more impacted by the fact that it's limited to 24 units per building and has to have a mix of apartment types. I think that's one of the limiting factors that makes people not want to use the apartment section of the bylaw. Um, instead, they resort to mixed use buildings or they resort to um, using section 9.22, which is what the Aspen Heights project on Route 9 used, where they're taking an existing use and they're doing something that's similar and not more detrimental to the neighborhood, but making it really big. Um, so I'm not sure that allowing apartments in the RG. Well, apartments are already allowed in the RG. They're just limited as to their size. So changing the mechanism by which apartments are allowed, I mean, not, but I think allowing them to be bigger, not just 24 units. For instance, the building on Route 9 is 88 units. And it's, I think, a really nice looking building. But to limit apartments to being only 24 units Per building, you end up with things like the boulders and South Point and, you know, things that we're not, in the, and presidential, which I don't think are really a very good use of land. Um, so that's something that you could really do and, and it would make a big difference. Can someone remind me, is footnote M where the 24 limit is or is that the mix of units? Or it's neither? Neither. Footnote M is um, requiring 4,000 square feet of lot area, an additional 4,000 square feet of lot area for each dwelling unit for certain okay. types of uses. And the, the regular amount of lot area that you would be required to have in those particular zones is 2,500. So going from 2,500 to 4,000 is a pretty big jump. And that was um, instituted because of the Spruce Hill development on High Street. Neighbors were so horrified by it that they uh, instituted that zoning bylaw, but there's really no um, no need for that. So um, I think that could be done away with easily. Yeah, I wanted to um, just second the uh, apartment definition one as well. I mean, I think that um, footnote M and the 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 cap on units are again. When, when I say these are easy things to write, it's because for some of them, we don't have to write any new text, right? Both of those would just be striking something from the zoning bylaw. And so it could be done pretty easily, but you know, we could even pair them as a, as a package of, these are two things to help unlock apartments um, in a way that I don't know if they'd be controversial, but they're, they're two things that um, I think are both fairly arbitrary. And so, um, would make sense also as a starting point of, you know, in addition to fixing the BL of here are things that are just sort of arbitrary or broken in the bylaw that we can fix. Are there any other suggestions for a three month sort of potential items for three months? Dave, we put you on mute. I, I put you on mute because we were getting a lot of background noise from you for some reason. Are you saying I'm full of background noise? Is that what you're saying? I don't know whether it was because it wasn't through your headphones and the computer mic was the one picking it up. I have no idea, but we were getting background noise. So what were you Sorry. saying? Um, no, no, no. This has been a great conversation. Um, the three to four, three to five months, um, 
The only thing I would add is, you know, hoping that we we add maybe one more lens, which is kind of the COVID lens, kind of coming out of COVID. What what do these, you know, if we pick four or five or whatever the magic number is here to get done in the first three to five months, um, do, you know, just applying the COVID lens, you know, how can that help downtown? Um, we know it's going to get worse before it's get, it gets better downtown. Um, I don't know. I, I don't have any specifics, but just kind of applying that COVID uh, overlay to these things. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I'm not a zoning expert, but you know, demo delay has been on the list for a long time. Is it is it easy to get through? Maybe it is. I'm not sure if I apply the COVID lens to demo delay, I'm not sure it really helps that much. I think it's a nice thing to get done. I think it'll help in the in the mid to longer range. We've had a lot of complaints about the demo delay. But anyway, I'm curious if Chris, if Chris has any thoughts on kind of applying COVID to, to some of these things. I think that Article 14 goes a long way to um, loosening up regulations regarding um, rebirth after COVID-19, because Article 14 is in effect until the end of December of 2021. So that means that businesses that want to start downtown, restaurants, um, you know, small stores, whatever, whatever would have normally required site plan review or um, special permit would now be under um, Article 14 and would be allowed by approval by the building commissioner. So I think we have that in place, at least as far as the end of December of, of next year. And that's going to, you know, grease the wheels as far as getting businesses back in place in the downtown. Um, elsewhere in town, I think that it would apply elsewhere in town too, for village centers and business districts. Um, so we, we have that. So I'm not feeling a lot of urgency to make changes that would, um, you know, help businesses get back because I think they have that at least in the short term. I think what I was going more for Chris was kind of the vision like applying the vision of, of a post-COVID downtown and a post-COVID village center because I'm not really sure you know article 14 is great but certain retail is going to come back restaurants are going to come back but I'm, I, I was kind of looking further and saying you know, are there things we can do to set ourselves up downtown and in our village centers to be better prepared for a new and different local economy than the one we've had? Because I, I think many of us are concerned that if we just rebuild what we have, it is going to be as vulnerable as it was to the pandemic. Um, and, and I don't know about you, but I don't see retail coming back. I think it'll be weaker than it ever was in our downtown because I just don't think any of us are going back to retail, even in the same way we did before the, the pandemic, which was local retail was dying. So I don't know, I'm just, I'm just free, free, freewheeling here a little bit, probably not focused enough, but thinking about, for instance, connections to the university, are we doing enough with our zoning so that we are being visionary to say, you know, um, are there ways that we can be more in sync with with when the university gets back on its feet that we are providing opportunities for uh, spinoffs and, and some of the things that are coming out of the university to actually land locally, I guess is where I was going. I mean, in my mind, Dave, that begs the question about one way down here, which is the zoning map potentially, um, you know, to land stuff coming out of spinoffs coming out of a university, we need to prep, um, you know, the, I don't know whether it's the industrial, but certain areas of our zoning for things. Um, and I'm not saying this very well at all, um, but, but that's, that, that to me goes to, do we have the right mix of each zoning zone in town, um, 
and I don't know whether we could even do that in 12 months. That goes to what we were talking about with RG and RO and R, you know, RVC and all these things with lot sizes and everything and up zoning or down zoning or rezoning to completely different types of uses. Um, but maybe it is allowing more types of uses in random zones through special permit to help prepare for that. You know, um, it, we've heard a lot about a, a professional medical offices that have problems getting into professional research parks and other things like that, that maybe what we need to look at is our use chart um, and what is a no in all of these zones and to prep out of COVID to try and catch spinoffs is to move things to special permit in some of these zones um, instead of a flat out no. And Oh, so th that's that's where my mind goes with what Dave is saying, um, and I have no idea whether it's even doable in twelve months. But um, so yeah, and let's we, let's go back on the earlier track because I don't want to get us sidetracked on that. That might be a bigger, longer discussion, and I, I think you guys were going in a really good direction here, identifying those. Sidetrack us to respond, um, and then we'll get back to our conversation. So may I say something? Uh, sure, Christine. Um, so. Um, I've thought about this, and um, I think there are two ways to expand the um, use of land for spinoffs from the university. And one of them is to expand the PRP zone and expand the light industrial zone. But in order to do either one of those, you would probably be taking land that is zoned um, outlying residents or limited density residents. And those two zones are sort of sacrosanct in the minds of the public. And so you'd be, you know, kind of running into the wind to try to um, rezone some of those areas, unless they're right on the edges of PRP or right on the edges of um, limited industrial. I don't feel like people are going to want to change large portions of our residentially zoned land, which is a lot of it is agriculture and forest to an industrial or um, you know, office park type of zoning. It's something that we can look at, but I don't feel like it's really gonna change things that much. I do think that allowing different uses in some of these zones might make sense. And for instance, what Mandy Jo mentioned, um, we have research and development, um, we have a research and development overlay district along University Drive. Maybe we could, um, look at the PRP zoning district and make sure that it can accommodate the same kinds of uses that this research and development overlay accommodates on University Drive. And if not, you know, put that overlay over some of the PRP. Um, anyway, that it, those are things that we can look at, but I, I guess I would kind of recommend against taking large areas of residentially zoned property and, you know, making them into limited industrial or PRP. Thanks. Um, I want to, before Evan, you speak, I know you unraised your hand. Sarah has joined us. So welcome, Sarah. Um, we are talking about zoning priorities and you're probably like, what is going on here? <laughs> you just stepped into this conversation, but we are trying to take this chart and figure out what we're going to recommend that council have priorities on. And once Evan speaks, I will summarize where we are with a really short term three month priority list. So Evan. Yeah, so I guess I just want to um, pick up on, on something that Dave said, um, you know, the COVID lens. And I think that what we've recognized in just the conversation we've had in the past seven minutes or so is that there's the COVID emergency lens and the COVID recovery lens. And so I think the COVID recovery lens is, is maybe the more interesting one um, to me. And there's a lot of ways to look at it, some of which um, you've all touched on. One of the other things I just want to throw in there because I think that it merges a bunch of things is um, one thing that I think we've really learned in, um, in our emergency response to COVID is how valuable um, our outdoor spaces are. Um, and God, we, we took away parking to do outside dining in an emergency response. And in the, what, two years that we've been counselors, I don't think there's anything that's been done that I've heard such positive feedback on we, um, as um, improving 
um, the ability for people to conduct business, whether it's retail or restaurant, outdoors. The, the public, and, and what I think we're going to see is when COVID goes away, folks are still going to want that. Um, I think that people enjoyed being able to eat at restaurants outside, at restaurants that haven't historically had outside dining. And, and where this sort of brings me to is actually, um, to some extent, design guidelines. You know, when I read the design guidelines for um, the 40R district, I was somewhat surprised because I always think of design guidelines just as the facade of the building, the, the physical look of the building. And yet the 40R design guidelines really delved into the streetscape itself. And I'm wondering, I guess, if going forward, thinking about, I know we have um, BG district setbacks on here, but thinking about design guidelines, not just in terms of the buildings, but also in how we use the streetscape will also be important because what we can do is use design guidelines to build into our zoning um, uh, development that factors in the fact that people are going to want to be outside more going forward. And, and so that when we have new developments, we encourage maybe bigger setbacks that we could put in space where there could be outside dining and stuff like that. And so I think there's a lot of ways to think about COVID recovery, but I think one of the things we're gonna see is that people really liked the warm, uh, the warm weather outside experiences. And if there's a way that we can build that into our zoning going forward, I think that would be beneficial. So I'm gonna summarize where we are for Sarah's benefit and those who may have joined us. We are trying to come up with some priorities. In last meeting, we reached consensus on where the council priorities for consultant money would be, which is in design guidelines, um, form-based zoning or design guidelines, however you want to um, phrase that and refer to that. And we've been at this meeting talking about what maybe really short-term priorities would be that, what can we see in three months? And, and we're talking about mainly council guideline, council priorities, not those that we see on this chart from the planning department. And we've talked about um, adding the BL to footnote B, adding footnote A to lot coverage and lot size, I think it was, um, bringing back the supplemental dwelling unit bylaw from 2018. Uh, demo delay is almost getting there, so that might be something we see. Um, starting a conversation on housing types and expanding where certain housing types can be built in town, moving apartments into the site plan review section, um, permit in more areas instead of special permit, removing footnote N regarding apartments and apartment definitions in terms of potentially removing caps on units or enlarging the cap on unit numbers and the types of, I guess it's no, the, the multiple unit types that are required to be in apartments, I guess, is a way to say it. They can't all be one un, one bedroom units right now, um, those definitions of what apartment is. So that's where we are at three month priorities. We were trying to circle to, are there any more on the list of three month priorities? And I put three months in as we would be able to see some, some language within the next three months on that. Does anyone else have any they want to add to this list that is getting long and quickly out of the realm of being able to be done in three months with all of it that's on it. Um, well, it shows you what a limited tool zoning is because I completely agree with everything that Evan was saying that the occupation of the outdoor space, particularly parking lots or parking spaces was done out of necessity, but it's also a brilliant move because it it's fun. It's fun to see people eating out and it's attractive. I mean, this happens in big cities all the time, right? So it's relatively limited in Amherst until now and now it's now it's everywhere. But the idea of those spaces becoming parking spaces again is kind of heartbreaking. So I guess I can, this is not a zoning issue, which is where I'm going with this, but expanding those you know, particularly that part of, let me get my Pleasance right, um, North East, no, North Pleasant, you know, it, where Antonio's and all, all those, that string of restaurants is. Um, taking away that seating and making those parking spaces seems heartbreaking because it could become part of an extended sidewalk 
which we already have in other parts of downtown. But I'm not sure how we deal with that with zoning. In other words, I think that that's more of a public way issue. But I also do agree that the one place that it is addressed is in the 40 r proposal. I am not seeing any other requested additions to that three month list, which means we're going to move on to the six to 12 month list, um, which is as far as we'll probably get today on this. And, and when I say six to 12 months, that means potentially things that we could start seeing in, you know, August, September for potential vote, I guess, by December, because in January, there would be a new council, December of 2021, January 2022, there's a new council. Um, and so if you allow three months for it to get through to hearing three to four months to get through hearing and all, we'd be looking at presentation initially to council sometime in August or September. Um, uh, what, what types of, what priorities might we have for something like that? Or is the list we already came up with where we are? Evan. So I, I mean, the list, the three month list we came up with became pretty substantial. Although, as we said, some of those, at least to produce the actual amendment are, are pretty, um, uh, doesn't take a lot of time. The two that I, I will say they're my priorities, but I also think that they are shared priorities amongst a number of counselors that I've spoken to. Um, one is what we talked about earlier, the idea of um, taking a look at some of the dimensional regulations in the RG and, and I think also it should be the RVC. You know, one of the things I wanted to say, um, I forgot to say earlier it, about the COVID lenses, one of the other things I think will be important is also really putting a lens on our village centers and not just on our downtown. Um, and so I think the RG is important, but the RVC is also, um, if we're going to keep the RVC as a separate district important. Um, I think that's something that, again, I think there's there's broad consensus um, across the council that there's at least interest in looking at, um, you know, do you need a 12,000 square foot lot? And maybe the solution is, you know, my preference, which is to reduce the minimum lot size. Maybe the solution is what Steve recommended about allowing um, a variation um, within reason through special permit. But I think looking at those dimensional regulations in some of the denser neighborhoods. And then the second thing, um, which I know that the planning board is interested in, I'm interested in, I've talked to other counselors, um, which Chris mentioned earlier, is the idea of um, um, lowering barriers to the development of duplexes um, and also potentially triplexes. I know this is something that the planning board has um, was working on. Um, and I know this is something I'm interested in. Again, these are two things that I think take more effort than the things in our initial list. Um, because again, you know, uh, Chris hinted at, there might be some neighborhoods, uh, maybe, maybe duplexes make sense in all residential neighborhoods. I certainly think they do, but maybe triplexes don't make sense in every single residential neighborhood, maybe just in some. And so there's, they're, they're more, both of those are more complicated, but I don't think that they're so complicated that they couldn't be done in a year. Um, and those are two that I think um, could have uh, potentially um, a significant impact on housing um, as we look to our housing policy next. Um, but, and I think also send um, important messages, um, you know, about what we're thinking about around housing. And that I think maybe would be controversial, but I think among the council, there will probably be broad agreement around those two things. So those are, those are my two uh, six to 12 month or eight to 12 month priorities. Steve or Sarah? It, uh, so the first thing that Evan said was the housing RG dimensions or RVC dimensions. What was the second thing? I couldn't quite. Duplexes and triplexes, lowering barriers. So oh, got it, got it, got that it. includes adding the ability to build them by right in various different residential zones. Yeah. So um, one of the things that a Evan and others talk about a lot is basically getting rid of single family exclusionary zoning. So in other words, any zone that you can only build a single family house by right. But we, the only places where we don't have that, so you can do it by special permit in pretty much every residential zone, yes, except for, so, so basically changing that to SPR, is that what 
you're thinking or changing it to just a, a Y? I'm as, I guess I'm asking Evan if that's okay. Yeah. Um, if, if you're asking, I mean, my ideal would be changing it to a Y, treating them the same as single family oh. homes, but I, I think changing it from SP to SPR could be useful. And then of course with triplexes, we don't even have, that's yeah. not even allowed at this point, so. Um, so I think that that one idea of changing duplexes to SBR everywhere that there's an R zone, except for residential, R fraternity zone, to me that makes a lot of sense. And uh, and then part of it is that I was thinking about say taxes. So um, generally people are willing to pay taxes if there are kind of no exceptions to that. Like this is a tax that, um, you know, that everyone pays and you, you, you basically know that you have to pay it. So to me, it never really made sense that certain R zones are SPR and other R zones are SP because to me, I always felt that if we're going to, you know, if we're going to take that hit, if we're going to agree that that's a good thing for Amherst is to allow these single family housing lots to be developed more densely, double the density, then we should allow that everywhere. So I, I, that's one that I completely support. Um, the dimension one, I have to think of, I know, and I know that I've been the one that's pointed out my own house about, you know, how this could never be built today but I also know that um, all around me are big lots that are filled with two family houses and three family houses and more. So I think that the density has been accommodated in other ways. So, but the first one I definitely support. I think the other one is more controversial and needs a lot of study. Um, when you get to really narrow lots, there are design problems that come up. So, but I, I guess I st also stand by what I was said earlier that I do think that we shouldn't have a hard no at, at um, the frontages that we have, that we should have a soft no, like a special permit in some cases to vary a little bit. May I say something about the duplexes? Yes. Yeah. So a number of years ago, we did change our zoning bylaw to allow duplexes by right in the RG zoning district. And what we ran into was um, developers, investors, yep. whatever, coming in and buying them up and then not managing them properly. Yep. And so we changed um, the law to say that if you were an owner-occupied duplex, you could be, you could have it by by right or by site plan review. But if you were a um, non-owner-occupied duplex, you had to have a special permit. And I think um, there was a reason for that because the houses that were being bought up by investors were not well managed. And so there has to be a way of kind of forcing these um, owners of properties to manage them properly, not to um, disrupt neighborhoods. So I'm, I'm throwing that out there because I think that um, the idea of allowing duplexes all over town in every residential district um, by right is going to run into a buzzsaw. And I should be clarified that I was talking about the owner-occupied duplex when I was, yeah, I'm not sure of, but not the non-owner-occupied duplex. All right, thank you. Sarah, do you have anything to add? So for the most part, I don't have any issues with the things that we're talking about. You know, I, I think that it, you know, adds a lot more life and diversity and, and people, which is fantastic. The only thing I would say is somebody who lives in a village center is that I think the council also talks a lot about um, community, um, what forms community, uh, walkable community. And so one of the things that I would like to see us try to do, and I'm not sure if it has to do, again, I'm not sure how much of this has to do with zoning, but I think it, it, it might in some ways, is that while we're encouraging um, diversity in housing and maybe more density, I would like us to also be looking at what kind of businesses 
we allow or encourage or what the spots are so that when you have a village center and you have uh, more people living there that they also have a place to get food or maybe see an outside art venue or things that um, that make community and that your basic needs can be met if you need to walk into your, you know, your village center. And the other thing is um, also, if we're talking about getting rid of a lot of the parking, I think that we also need to look at how we're handling um, transportation, especially at night, so that if people are working, you know, later at night in restaurants or any other any other kind of building they can make it back home. And also if you live in North Amherst or South Amherst, maybe you decide not to have a car anymore. If you wanted to go somewhere in the middle of town at night that you could still get back home pretty easily later at night, 10, 11 o'clock at night. So those are just things I, I would just wanna see as sort of a, a balance as we look into that density. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll chime in with my echoing um, the, the issues of looking at the single family zoning or exclusive zoning that, that some of our areas have. Um, that's where I was going with the three month priority of start the conversation on housing type expansion. Um, you know, and so that, that's one where I look at this chart and seven counselors out of, I think I had 10 responses. 70% of the council um, was like, we need to figure this out. So th that, that's why I look at that and say that that I think should be a priority for this council because there's clearly um, some, some desire to focus on that. Um, so at this point, is there anything else people want to add to the three month or sort of the eight, nine month list um, from the council? I've tried to show everything. I'm missing reviewing the zoning map down here. And I'm missing recodification up there, but. I'm not seeing anyone jump up and say, here's something else. So I guess my next question is, are we ready with this conversation and with last week's regarding consultant money to take a recommendation to the council? And I ask that in trepidation from the fact that I have no idea what this motion would look like. <laughs> um, um, you know, I can read the list I've got again because um, I've been taking notes and then I, I, I just don't know what, you know, consultant money. Um, I feel like I, this is big enough that we might want to be able to see a motion. Yeah, so so this this becomes the question, right? You know, um, so let me here we go. Let me show. I'm I'm gonna stop this screen share and show a different screen share, which are my active notes. Um, Let me see if I can make it bigger. So those are my active notes from today's conversation. I, I don't know how to put that into a motion. Yeah, and, and the COVID lens ones, I'm not sure need to be in the motion. That was just, again, since it's my active notes, we had a little diversion to COVID lens. Um, so I, I threw that in there, but I would be looking at these three month priorities here as part of a motion that has eight items on it, um, the six to 12 month here, um, and then the consultant money is form-based zoning design guidelines. So I'd just like to mention the fact that in the three month priorities, remove footnote, it's M as in Mary. I, I went back and forth like six times <laughs> between M and N. <laughs> Thank you for that clarification. So, and I'm not sure demo delay is a council priority. So I'm going to highlight that, or at least I thought I was going to highlight that. That was one that Christine mentioned is something that could probably be done in three months, but that's not one that was on the council list of priorities. Evan, you were going to say something? Yeah, so I'd be fine with essentially 
I'm trying to read this quickly. If we remove the COVID lens thing, since that was a little bit of a, a detour that we should return to later, um, making a motion that the council send this list of priorities to the town manager. Um, the only thing just to clean it up a little bit, um, adding footnote a, under three, adding footnote A um, it sh to, uh, I think it's maximum lot coverage and maximum building coverage, I think are the two. I don't, surprisingly don't have the dimensional regulations open in front of me at this moment. I, I, don't know either. I have them. But I think those are the two ones that we're that, looking for. That's right. You're correct. Would we remove demo delay from this list for our purposes? The only, the only reason I might keep it in there is because Mandy, when you brought it up in that town council discussion, um, whenever it was, it, it, it did seem like a fair number of counselors. Um, I know at least me and I think Dorothy and I think Kathy all sort of spoke in support of doing something. And so it didn't come out when people submitted theirs, but when it was, so it wasn't something that people thought about when they were asked to provide priorities, but when it was mentioned in a council discussion, there did seem to be at least multiple counselors who were interested. So demolition delay, blah, 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 blah. demolition delay isn't important until it is, and it's becoming, so we're reaching an age where almost every building that is to be added onto or, or, or torn down or altered will be subject to the current demolition delay. In other words, we're, we're reaching the period where there was a extensive building in Amherst. So buildings that are being renovated are all, all reaching the threshold. I'm not explaining that very well. So it, it's not like the days of where we were protecting the carriage houses and the, you know, the quaint buildings from, from long ago we're, we're coming. <laughs> We're coming to a period of building where the um, there was an extensive amount of building done in Amherst that will all be subject to demolition delay if there's any altering of it. So anytime anyone goes for a building permit and there's a garage behind their house or whatever, the likelihood of that being subject to demolition delay is increasing. So, so it's actually a significant barrier to some kinds of development. And it, oftentimes it's development of a house, you know, or something like that, or a expansion of a house. Well, the new demolition delay bylaw, am I muted or not muted? New okay. demolition mm -hmm. delay bylaw gives the staff the first crack at deciding whether something is significant yeah. or not. And if it's significant, yeah. then it moves on to the historical commission. But if it's deemed not to be significant, then it doesn't go through the demolition delay process. So it's going to make it, um, easier for people in the situation that Steve was just described to go ahead and you know take down the 1963 garage in order to build an addition onto their house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Evan, do you have any idea of what a motion might look like? Could, well, can I just make one more edit? Is under uh, six to 12 month priority, I feel like dimensional regulations in the REG and RVC covers um, the third bullet, which is frontage regulations for the RG and other residential zones, unless the whole point is that that, that that bullet would extend to all residential, whereas the first one is just the RG and RVC. Well, I think Steve had been talking about like RO frontage res regulations too, right? Which is why I put other residential zones there. Because the whole thing, everything. He regularly talks about splitting an RO lot in two that has 198. Or that's hey. RG, but uh, oh, that's yeah. RG. Okay. But I think it's everything. I think that back to my theory about taxes that if we're going to allow a variance on any frontage, we should allow it everywhere. So then, maybe just frontage regulations for residential zones. We don't need it for yeah. RG. Yeah. Yeah. And then, it, and then that at least helps us understand what how it's different from the first bullet. Okay. Yep.
I think it's more likely to be used in RG because most of RG is pre-zoning and most of the other zones are not pre-zoning. So our, yeah, I'll have to look at the map. Mm -hmm. Anyone got a draft motion? You, you had some wording about recommend, the council recommend to the manager? Well, so we would be recommending that the town council would submit to the town manager the following zoning priorities, what's the, but then what's the next half of that motion? To For direct... What, what we're actually essentially asking then is um, the planning department then to return to us zoning amendments. So what's the... For revisions to be made in time I'm wondering if is there any is there any necessity or or interest in linking this? You had one of the goals, one of his goals as referencing zoning. Would there be any yeah. purpose in referencing that goal that you've already given him? You know, as per goal number 17, or I, I don't know what number it was, you know. We submit to the town manager the following zoning priorities. For you know, da, da 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 da, and encourage him to direct staff to go forth and <laughs> and create and write. And now. This is the problem. So I'm going to look up what that goal. Or let me see if I can find that goal. Yeah, do you have it easily accessible? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I I have to find where all of that went. Um, Because it's where did where did I file the town manager goals is the question. Um, give me a second, but if someone can work on some other language, um... if I could blab a little bit. So this is not tidy at all, right? Because um, we definitely need planning staff to help with this. But in the end, and only the the manager. The executive side is the, the planning staff rests in the executive side, but then the legislative side is the side that creates law. So we could just be directing ourselves. I don't, I, it's not a tidy, and then where does the planning board sit? So the planning board is appointed by us, but it really serves a, you know, a whole different capacity. So who exactly are we directing? Or do we have to direct anybody? Well, the planning board has to hold public hearings on whatever they're given. Yeah. They can also choose to initiate zoning amendments if they want to. Right. But I think that the wording that Dave suggested, which is to encourage the town manager to direct staff to, you know, develop language to what implement or mm, not implement, but make these revisions happen. That's not the right word wording, but that's what you mean, right? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. Councillor Ross could say, you know what? I'm going to make a proposal to add footnote A and um, get the president to put that on the agenda, so then everyone would be obligated to hold the planning board would be obligated to hold the public hearing. Um, so what others we could bypass the whole. I'm not suggesting that we do that all. It's just not a there's not a tidy way of explaining what it is that we're trying to, what we're trying to achieve. So we, we need the executive branch and the legislative branch to work together ideally, but it's not a requirement that they work together. Right, so there's the goal. Do 
just so you can see what it was. So the following zoning priorities, what was all the language to submit the following for to for encouragement or I don't know what was the language? To encourage the town manager to direct staff to X. To develop zoning amendments. Right, Maybe that's it. Zoning amendments consistent with the following zoning priorities, something like that. Consistent with or reflecting or achieving the following zoning priorities. We need to reference that list. Yeah. I think just to just to respond while we're doing this to respond to Steve, I guess, you know, my my thought on this is we are expressing to the town manager that these are the things that we would like to see. These are the zoning amendments that we would like to see staff produce. Um, but I don't I think that the other side of that is that the council as the legislative body could, in theory, just move forward with something that a counselor writes. But I think that doing it this way gives deference to the planning department to originate zoning amendments. But if we don't, I mean, we don't necessarily have to adopt what comes to us, or maybe if, if we say we want this done in three months and it's not getting done, you know, a counselor could take action. But I think starting this way at least um, places the responsibility with the planning department. I must say, if I may, that if counselors have language in any of these categories that they would like to send to us to sort of prime the pump or jumpstart us, I would welcome, I would welcome that. My note for the report. <laughs> so there's our motion. The list is here. Um, so so I guess I'll make it. We, we revised this so much. Um, to recommend in accordance with council policy goal three is what it was, not two. Economic vitality and the specific one was facilitating the review and revision of the zoning bylaws to promote diverse not neighborhoods, affordable housing and new growth in the downtown and village centers. The council to encourage the town manager to direct staff to develop zoning amendments in order to achieve the following zoning priorities. And then under that is this list that is in gray now. So I'm gonna make that motion. I'll, I'll second that if that's what you're waiting for. Yep. Is there any discussion? The only thing that I would say, um, this is, I think, uh, I, I don't envy you for having to write this report um, because I think that there's aspects of this that I just want to make sure explained. So I think that use of consultant money form based zoning design guidelines, that's, you know, we're, we're really going to need to explain how we came to that decision, which was largely that that's sort of what the money was appropriated for. Because um, I think there'll be, you know, a lot of people who say, well, why, do, why not other things? And so um, being able to justify um, that one and then also sort of explaining the idea of some of these three month priorities being sort of like incremental steps um, would also be useful. Any other comments? Seeing none, we're going to vote. We start with Evan. Yes. Steve. Yes. Sarah. Yes. 
And Mandy is a yes, that is four to zero. Um, I, let me stop this there before we move on. Um, it is tentatively scheduled for discussion on Monday's council meeting in less than a week um, with wondering whether we got to that today or not. So I will inform um, Lynn that we did vote today so that it will likely stay on the meeting for Monday night. Um, I am going to let you guys know right now that there will be no report until Saturday. Um, I will not have time tomorrow or Thursday to even begin writing it. So it probably won't get out till Thursday, till Saturday. Um, with Wendy, that. Wendy, oh, Joe, may I uh, just um, clarify something? I, I would expect then that you would want um, me to be at that meeting, at that town council meeting, if the town council is going to be um, looking at this list or are they just gonna see it for the first time and then discuss it sometime in the future? Let me check with Lynn on that and I'll CC you on an email on that. Um, my guess is this is the first of at least two discussions because I, I, I can't imagine the council acting on day one on this, but I can't also ever guess what the council will do. Um, so, so I'm guessing it would take at least two meetings, but let me see what, what Lynn wants for that. Um, and I'll, I'll include you on that email. And someone from the CRC would give a presentation and planning department staff would not be um, giving that presentation or I, that's not the right way to ask, or ask the question. If you want us to give a presentation, please let us know. Thank you. I, I, I will rope you in and do that. My guess is the most, you know, more of being there to answer questions would be my guess, but I will, I will check with Lynn. Okay. Um, and we'll get moving on that. Um, I am going to switch the order of the agenda for now and take public comment now before we move on to housing so we know exactly how long we have to deal with the housing policy. So if anyone is here for public comment, um, hit the raise hand button if you would like to make public comment. And if you've called in, there's a, I think it's star nine um, that you would have to do, but I don't think we have any callers in. So I don't think that's gonna be an issue. You will have three minutes to make public comment within the jurisdiction of matters within the jurisdiction of the CRC. Right now I see one hand, so bear with me as I work on recognizing Janet McGowan and doing all the buttoning to get her allowed to speak. <laughs> I think I, am I here? We can hear you, Janet. Good, thank you so much for um, moving your public comment to this time. Um, I asked this question a few months ago and I wanted to ask it again. Um, when are, is the CRC going to go to the public with this priority chart and seek at their feedback? And so um, is it after you go to this town council or just, you know, where's the public part of this process? Because I think, you, had, you know, earlier you had said that that would happen, but I'm not clear on that where the public gets notified and, and also kind of how. So just wondering where that piece, what that piece will be and when it will happen. Thank you for that comment. Um, we will figure that out at a time, but there is always allowed public comment at any meeting um, of CRC and of the town council. Um, and these are just a list of items. They are not the proposals yet. And so I would also say that when proposals come forward, at least as it relates to zoning, there is always a public hearing as well as many discussions at meetings. So thank you for that. Is there any other, um, public comment. Seeing none, we are going to move on to our next agenda item, which I think I'm gonna, before we do that and before everyone else leaves, um, Christine and Ben, I wanna thank you for your time. I don't know whether you guys are interested in housing policy or not. <laughs> You're more than welcome to stay, but my guess is this is not something that's going to involve you. So if you wish to leave, you may. Um, we thank you for your time on zoning priorities and look forward to working with you as we move forward on a number of zoning issues in the coming year. So thank you all for this and for the chart and everything. And Christine, I'll be in touch with you on Monday and, and what all's going on there, okay? All right. Thank you. So next up is how. Thank you. 
Um, and comprehensive housing policy. So I want to thank Evan. <laughs> I, I went to, I, I did a bunch of revising and then I, uh, Evan actually asked if I wanted help and I said, great. <laughs> um, and, and I sent him uh, the revision I had and he redid it and did a fantastic job on stuff. So I just wanna acknowledge Evan's work on the document that we're going to put on the screen soon. Um, and then I also, back when Pat was on the CRC, Pat DeAngelis, Councilor DeAngelis, she was not just willing, excited and, and looking forward to working on a housing, a comprehensive housing policy. So I, when I got this back from Evan and was seeking, you know, comment, I reached out to her and asked her for her comments, which is why you see in the comment section of this document, a number of comments from Councilor DeAngelis because I, I went to her and said, hey, we're getting there and you had asked to help. And so could you make some comments? So let me see if I can put this one up and see if I can find it. Um, let me find it first. Get it so I can. And what I hope to do on this one, this this meeting, is um, look at the introduction and the a, a little bit, but mostly concentrate on the strategies and the measurables section. Uh, we have done a lot with the goals and objectives and blurb under the objectives sections, and those haven't changed too much. Um, the introduction was changed slightly. I don't think we've really truly looked at it before. And then some of the other intros, you know, sort of explanatory sections were also changed. But I want to talk about strategies. We have about a half an hour. And if we can go through, I don't think we'll get through all the strategies. I want to leave the last 10 minutes to what we're doing, or maybe the last 15, um, 10 minutes or so on, is this in a form where we can distribute at least some of it out for feedback? And how do we want to do that? Um, so let's start with the introduction. Um, and all there's a structure question. As you see, it changed structure completely. At some point, we're going to have to decide on a final structure, and all. Um, but but for now, this is the structure we're having. It might facilitate us sending portions out sooner and splitting the portions out to send um, if they're separated like this. And in the end, we might decide to combine them back. But Evan. Yeah, so um, with regard to the introduction, the one thing uh, that I noticed when I was reading through this, but I didn't change, which I wanted to bring up because I know as Pat sort of brought this up the same thing, is um, if you just read, you know, we set this out as a comprehensive housing policy. It's not an affordable housing policy, but the introduction is, uh, especially this sort of middle paragraph is sort of, um, really focused on affordable housing. And so I guess um, maybe two changes. Uh, one is the, um, the second sentence, this policy supports the development of new affordable housing throughout Amherst, I think should either be just new housing or new affordable and market rate housing, because we are trying to do both. Um, I don't have a preference if it's just new housing or new affordable and market rate. Um, and then Pat pointed out that we say affordable housing comes with incomes less than 30% and 60%, but then we, then it makes it sound like we're only focused on those two, whereas we are also focused on less than 80%. And we do actually in the measurables mention 80 to hundred percent. And so I would maybe even just take, either we add the percentages there, I think, or we just take that out and say prioritizing funding with the free, the creation of affordable units or something like that across a range of affordability levels or something like that. You guys should all be able to see them as they happen. So if you don't like a change, speak up. <laughs> Any other thoughts on the introduction for now? 
it goes on over here too. Seeing none, we're gonna move on. Um, I said we would skip the housing policy goals and the objective sections today because those are what we've concentrated on the last two times we've talked about this housing policy. So we're going to move on to moving forward. Any thoughts on this one or any changes you would like to see to it before we move on to the actual strategies? Everyone seems happy, so we're gonna move on. And this is where we saw a whole lot of change between the last draft and this draft. Um, I went through and tried to combine everything. And then Evan not only combined stuff, he then organized it too. <laughs> I, I, I tried to say, oh, this, this item was in both the housing market study, the housing production plan and the master plan. So I went to one bullet point instead of four bullet points. Um, and Evan has added Evan did a whole lot to not only suggesting what priority level things are, um, but making it understandable and into paragraphs instead of random bullet points. It actually reads logical and understandable now, probably. Um, so Pat suggested that we look closely at each strategy and pose specific questions. Um, including, you know, does this strategy that we have make it possible to have the kind of diverse housing stock we're looking for, or might it unintentionally contribute to more high-end housing being built? Um, she was particularly concerned with tax credits um, and the unintended consequences that they might have. So, you know, I think as we go through these strategies, we need to talk about them specifically and whether they are something we want in high, medium, or low priority, um, and what those consequences may or may not be. Uh, Evan. So, yeah, so the other thing, so what I, you know, Mandy summarized what I did here, but I, I want to mention that with very few exceptions, everything that was in the original list is in here. Um, and if it was taken out, it's likely because it was um, uh, duplicative of, of a different bullet. So if there were several things that said the same thing, I just did one. But I guess one of the things I'm also interested in, because I'm not quite sure where I stand on this, is some of these strategies are really vague and could take a number of different forms, and some are really prescriptive. And I guess I'm not sure how prescriptive we want to be. And so do we, it, do we either want them to be very specific and prescriptive? Do we want them to be uh, clear enough that they set up, you could call it a strategy, but isn't saying here's the exact zoning amendment, which some of them do, or do we feel like it's okay to have a mix? Because there really is, I mean, some get down to here is the exact zoning amendment, and then some are like increased access, and it, it could mean a million different things. And I'm not sure exactly where I stand on that. So I guess as we're going through, that's another kind of uh, aspect that I'd, I'd like to hear opinions on. Thanks for that. Um... So let's start with the first goal, which is increased production of housing throughout Amherst. We wanna build more housing to create affordable housing and market rate housing. And so we'll start with um, the first high priority labeled is increased housing density in downtown and village centers. Uh, we were actually talking a little bit about this on zoning priorities. A lot of these we'll see intertwine. Um, so are there any thoughts on what Evan just said and what I just said as it relates to any of these four bullet points. Um, we'll start with increased units per building. This is one that is sort of in the middle on specificity. And I'll just say, one of the things that I did here was add the which may include clause, um, which was an attempt to sort of dampen down how directive or prescriptive it is, which was, here's what we overall want to do. And here are some examples, whereas I think in the original bullet points, each of these was just said, do this. But I don't know if that's something that people like or, you know. 
I get confused. So first, I think this is clear and generally great. I get confused around the building a large number of small units on a lot that allows one unit, adding units to existing buildings, altering the town's approach to calculating and regulating density. So maybe the part I'm not quite understanding is right, a large number of small units on a lot that only allows one unit. What does that mean? I think that's the right now single family zoning only allows one unit and start building cottage developments or you know up zone it or somehow change the zoning so that it could allow more than one unit. Is that is that what you're going with, Evan? Um, that's a great question. I don't question. remember what the bullet point said originally. You know, that's why right now I'm frantically trying to find my original document that showed where everything came from because I didn't write that. That was taken from one of the bullets. And so I'd have to figure out where that bullet originated from. And the reason I asked for, I guess it's just a matter of what terms are we using. So a building to me is a, like a self contained structure with a roof and, you know, walls, you know. And a unit is can be that, but it can also be an apartment within a building. So it seemed to me like the, the major heading, increased units per building, is talking about a single structure with walls, a roof, and a basement or a slab. How many apartments can you put in there, or how many whatever can you put in there? Um, but then cottage units, if that's what it's saying, that's a different thing, because those are separate buildings. Like if we're talking about small houses yeah. or cottage and developments on a single lot, then, or even accessory dwellings, that's a different, that's a different um, accessory detached dwellings. That's a different discussion. And I'm sorry, it's a nomenclature thing. So I think what Steve is going at is this one is in the wrong section. Maybe because it's increasing the units per building and this one might be increasing the number of buildings on a lot. Right. And there, there is a lot of discussion in the various commentary about um, like in the BL, you can build a building envelope of a certain size, but that it's never specified how many units there are. So you can build, there's a specification that there's a mix of units. But I think, yeah, I think this one's important. I just think that there's something misplaced there. Okay, so we'll delete that section there because I think it comes out somewhere else. Any other thoughts on the increased units per building as a high priority for increasing housing density in downtown and village centers? Seeing none, infill development. This is where SDUs and all. This is what? This could be where supplemental dwelling units, although this is not what what Evan put as SDUs, um, yeah. promote infill development for underutilized lots and land between buildings. You know, it's interesting because infill means something different to everybody. Um, and to me, it means two of these things, but it, to me, it means underutilized land, such as vacant lots and parking lots, does not necessarily mean land between existing buildings. Could, if that land between existing buildings is a parking lot, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. So it's not infill like a missing tooth necessarily, it's more Infill to me really means um, building up to either aspirational densities or to densities that are nearby. So there's the proposed amendment. Yeah. Well, once you do such as, then that's fine. It doesn't mean. Yep. Shall we move on? But in on? particular, Particular, I think one of the 
the real priorities is our brownfield sites. So like some vacant lots are, like a park could be seen as a vacant lot, right? So, okay, we have that. We have yeah, it there. as a low priority. <laughs> yeah. For the redevelopment of brownfields. And if, if I had yeah, to- Yeah, that means different things to different people too. Yeah, if I had to guess, the reason for that is we don't have a lot of that technical definition of brownfield yeah. and greenfield in our town. Like for me, so let me try to explain what I'm talking about. So. Um, like the parking lot behind, there's this, the parking lots that are, surface parking lots that are in sort of the north part of downtown near Bertucci's, <coughs> to me, those would be sort of high priority infill sites. But then there are other areas, say the other side of Kendrick Park, where there are more single, there, there are more apartment buildings on green space, that would be less of a priority for development. But maybe I'm just overthinking this. Comments on 40R, because if I, I guess my thoughts on the <coughs> are, if we put that on here with a flat out adopt it, we're coming out with a bold statement um, that no one has actually made yet, either at the town council or at the planning board, as far as I know. Um, and so is this something that should be written as boldly as it is right now? I think you could say, um, well, you could say consider support here, but you could also say adopt overlays or new zoning to increase allowable density. So without specifying that we mean 40R, because I agree we have not vetted 40R. I mean, we, we as a council have not vetted 40R. Sarah. So I actually would like it if we maybe um, came out with some softer language um, I would feel more comfortable with that because right now without um, having the benefit of talking to the rest of the council, initially I'm, I don't know that I'm crazy about it. Um, I'm gonna say that. Um, I'd also say if the rest of CRC feels like we need to make a stronger statement, um, I wouldn't vote against it, although, um, I would tell the rest of you that right now, I'm not a huge proponent right now of it. Well, yeah, thank you for that, Sarah. I, I am also unsure whether I like the current proposal or not on overlay district. So let's see if we can modify this to consider adopting overlay districts in downtown and village centers to increase allowable density while ensuring affordable housing production. Is that a better wording, Sarah? Yeah, I would feel more comfortable with that. And then we're on to adaptive re, oh, Evan. So I actually had raised my hand for another point, but I, I'm okay with that language, but I also sort of feel like if you say adopting an overlay district to increase density while ensuring affordable housing, you're talking about 40R, right? I mean. Uh, a, an overlay district that increases density in exchange for for if affordable housing is 40 r so I, i'm okay with i'm okay with this as is i'm definitely okay with the softer language because you know I, I agree the council actually hasn't had a good conversation about 40 r yet but to some extent i i feel like you know it, we're talking about 40 r so why not you know call it what it is um and just keep this smart growth overlay you know you don't have to you can say smart growth overlay district because what you're saying is consider adopting a smart growth overlay district which is a specific tool in yeah. these areas because even if even if we have differing opinions over the current 40r proposal we might like it for we might like a different version of that proposal or in a different location but i don't know it just seems weird to me to essentially call out 40r but to not use the name 40 to smart growth overlay district because that's what we're talking about but what i actually had originally raised my hand for was because again, my, my one of my primary interests today is how specific should we be? 
with the infill development, you know, are we, are we okay? And I, I know we moved beyond that, but I want to pull us back with the idea of this may include amending zoning bylaw 3.2 by adding infill development. I mean, that is a very specific recommendation. It's not as specific as it, that's directly from the housing market study. It's not as specific as in the housing market study, but it is fairly specific. And is that, are we comfortable with that level of specificity versus just the first sentence of promote infill development? Sarah or Steve? Well, see, I guess maybe the issue I have is that it doesn't have to be an overlay district. It can just be a change of zoning that also allows this. The infill development units, it doesn't have uh, to no, be- No, the 40 R, the 40 R oh. paragraph. In other words, overlay means that the underlying zoning is trumped, but the we could just simply change the underlying zoning. I think I'm going to say that Evan brings up a really good point that maybe we're making it softer, but we're actually saying exactly the, the same thing. I mean, if pressed, we're like, and you need to look at 40R. So yep. um, again, you know, I would have to say that if the majority of this, this committee would like to bring that, I wouldn't stand in the way. I do think it's a discussion that council has to have. Um, I guess I would just say for the sake of maybe not being surprising to everyone later on in a, in a, you know, a council situation, you know, I said yes. And then later I'm like, you know, I really think we need to look at this carefully. I'm not sure I'm sold on it that the rest of you don't go, you know what, she just sat there and was quiet and said, <laughs> and said, yes, you know, I mean, so I, I just, I'm only saying it so that I give um, the rest of my committee an idea of the fact that, um, I'm not going to stand in the way of it going forward to talk about, but don't be surprised if I just bring up some questions. So that's, and I do agree with Evan. It does, maybe the language seems softer, but it's actually saying exactly the same thing. So maybe we want to keep it the way it is right now. So are we going back to 40R and the only adding the word consider to changing it to consider adopting instead of adopt and just leaving the rest as it was? You could also use the word like uh, investigate smart growth overlay districts in downtown, which is really about having a conversation. I mean, which we've kind of already, and, and the other reason I, I'm, I'm pushing back on this a little bit is like, so adopting I get, right? But consider adopt it. We've already developed, we've already put up the consult, we've hired consultants, we've spent a large sum of money um, to develop a 40 r proposal. There's been four public hearings. So some, like we're already talking about this. And so I get that adopt seems to put the cart before the horse, right? That's the saying. Um, but I also sort of feel like we are actively doing this. And so to soften the language and not mention 40 r because we don't wanna render judgment sort of ignores the fact that we're having this conversation anyway. And I get Steve's point of, well, we, it doesn't have to be an overlay district. And so we could completely change this bullet and just say, um, consider changing zoning to increase density, uh, you know, and, but that, that would be, that's a very different bullet than what this is right now. Yeah, I mean, that, that is pretty much the goal. If you change the bullet to consider changing zoning to increase density, that's kind of what the goal is. And we're trying to get what you would do to do that. Um, so I've now moved it back to just consider adopting. Um, I'm fine with that. Sarah, are you okay with that? Yep. Okay. Um, Can we just take the word adopting out, just consider smart growth overlay districts? I think adopting is a word that's gonna get people hung up. There we go. So back to Evan's question about specificity, infill development units, no one seemed to respond to your question. They were all stuck on smart growth zoning. Um, my response would be without that, we've got a bunch of platitudes without any actual strategy in a sense. You know? And so when we know there was a recommendation relate, directly related to infill development, I think it's good to put it in there, even if it still says may include, because it gives you, this is what that might look like. Um, so I, I'm okay with the specificity. 
I'm going to move on to adaptive reuse, which is again, um, that specificity thing, unless Steve's not ready to. Steve? Yeah, so this is my thing about um, if we're going to go for it, let's go for it everywhere. So if we're going to do it in field developments in any of the R zones, let's do it in all of the R zones. So infill, infill is all relative, right? So infill in RG looks different than infill in RO because the existing density is different. But um, you know, let's go for it if we're going to go for it. And I think that what you just wrote looks good to me. I just changed the yep, specific yep. ones oh. to residential zones. Yeah. Evan? Well, yeah, okay. I guess I'm curious, so. I mean, it's missing RLD and RO, and RF, yeah. RF isn't. RF is not a, it's not there's really only like home. three yeah. parcels that are RF um, anyway, so. Right, so I guess what I was gonna bring up, I'm, I'm rereading this and questioning why I put infill development in this section in the first place when the next section is increased housing density in neighborhoods surrounding downtown and village centers. And I guess the other question, which when we get, we can wait till we get to that creation to adaptive reuse first is, should this be a separate section? I sort of segmented out downtown and village centers and then the neighborhoods around them, but maybe there's no need to segment that because if we're talking about infill development, we might be talking about it also in the BL and the uh, BVC and the BN right, and not just the residential zones. So Evan makes a good point. This one is the non-residential zones of downtown and village center, which is BVC and BG and BL, none of the R zones. Yeah, you're right. The next one is the R zones. Yeah. The neighborhood surrounding. So yeah. we could just pull it out and pop it into the neighborhood surrounding. We also have the problem with adaptive reuse too. Which in that, in that one said R and RVC, RG and any village or business oh, district. Okay. So it, it sort of, all, which is why I guess, and I remember having this internal fight with myself about whether to even divide this into two sections or to just lump everything that's on the screen now into one section that's just increased building density in um, business districts, village centers, and residential areas or something like that. I separated them out just to create a little bit of space and blocking to help people better compartmentalize village center versus neighborhoods, but maybe that's not a useful division. I think it is. I'm just going to move infill development down to here. since that one is only residential. And we're at 354, so I'm not sure we're going to move on past priority number one. Um, yeah, I'm, I don't know why my hand is saying it is raised. Oh, I, I'm not in the attendees either, so. <laughs> that that's odd. Um, so we're not going to move on past that. We will continue the discussion of strategies at our next meeting in two weeks. Um, I'm going to stop. Actually, yeah, I'm going to stop the share for now. Um, this document won't change substantially from what you've seen. Now, is it time for us to send the goals and objectives off to various committees for review and comment and feedback. Thoughts? Evan's nodding yes, I think. Yeah. I'm gonna I, say yes, too. Yeah. So is that just me shipping it off with a request? Um, is it us having a discussion as to exactly what we're looking for. Um, I think Evan had mentioned to me the possibility of inviting the chairs of various committees to a meeting. 
so that we can discuss what we've been doing and what kind of feedback we're looking for. Um, what, what are thoughts on how the request for feedback should look? So, so I guess I'll just start and say, you know, I think um, context is always important um, to be able to provide um, the, the context that what we're showing them right now is not the entire document. Um, it's just the first step and also giving them some idea of um, what kind of information we're looking for from them. And that's where I felt like sometimes that's better done in a conversation than as a directive. And that's where I suggested to Mandy when I spoke to her a couple of weeks ago, the idea of maybe bringing in, of inviting in as panelists, the chairs of a couple of the relevant bodies to just say, here's where we're at, here's what we've done. And it doesn't have to be a long thing, but it also gives them an opportunity to ask questions about what we're doing, where we are in the process, what we're looking for from them, other than just sending it in a memo. And it doesn't have to be a long discussion. Maybe it's just the first 20 minutes of our next meeting, but I, I do feel like having a conversation with the chairs about, because this is just a piece and because it's part of a big, bigger document, a bigger process, having that conversation about where we're at, what we're looking for and what the next steps are might just be better to be had as a conversation as opposed to a memo. What are Steve and Sarah's thoughts on that? I, I think that it would be a good idea to, I mean, if, if we're assuming, right, that we're all going to be in the same committees for at least what, another month or two months, I would think talking to the chair, because that way it, it frames the discussion. So we can tell them what we're thinking and doing. And then when they send it to their committee, right, then they can ask more pointed questions or give some context or know how they would like to conduct the conversation to be more fruitful. Agreed. Okay, so I will, with us getting through zoning priorities this week, um, I think we can dedicate, I'm not sure there's much coming to us through a council meeting, I'll have to check, but I think we can dedicate most of the next meeting to housing policy, which is in two weeks, which is the 15th. Um, I will invite chairs, but I need to know what committees we think we need to send this out to. So, I'm just going to throw a couple out of ones that seem obvious, which is planning board, um, the housing trust, ECAC, um, the zoning board of appeals. Those are the ones I can think of. Um, I, CPA, I guess, because we're talking on some of the goals about CPA and CDBG money. Um, we could add the two of them to it. Lots that that gives me a list of one, two, three, four, five, six committees: planning and zoning, uh, ECAC, the housing trust, and CPA and CDBG. I'm just getting nods and a whole lot of silence. That's what happens in a Zoom meeting. <laughs> I'll take that as no one can think of any other committees that that this should go to. Um, I actually I do have a question about tech, transportation. One of our things is talking about you know I mean this is a housing policy, but it deals with you know as Sarah mentioned in zoning priorities you know, things like transportation are important to housing. Um, and I don't know whether we have any strategies that deal specifically with transportation or not. I think we do have a walkability, bikeability section somewhere in there. Um, is, is TAC something, is TAC a committee we think could be useful on this in terms of their expertise related to transportation as it relates to these housing policy goals? I don't think so. Okay. Seeing that it is six committees, I will send an invitation out to those six committees. 
chairs to invite them to our next meeting for conversation as it relates to our draft housing policy in preparation for seeking their committee's feedback. Um, anything, and, and obviously I'll send them the, I'll, I'll fix up the first half. The part I intend to send them is everything up to the strategies section we were just working on. So through moving forward um, is what, what we'll be sending them as modified today and strategies and the beyond will not go to them because we haven't even been through that yet. Uh, any other thoughts or requests as it relates to housing policy? Evan. Hey, real quick, um, just give people homework. One of the things that I have struggled with a lot when I was um, editing this that I was hoping to um, improve but just didn't get a chance to is I think the real weakness of this document right now is the measurables. Um, and, and I guess I'd be curious um, if we could make sure we spend some time thinking about that and talking about that next time, because I think we have some very specific measurables and then some not and, and figuring out how specific and how quantitative versus qualitative we want measurables is gonna be an important um, piece of this. So just throwing that out there. Okay. I will make a note that we deal with measurables or try to get to measurables next time, even if we don't get to strategies. If we if we finish our committee chair conversations that we move to measurables and we'll come back to strategies. Because um, the strategies is, are, as you say, at least fairly well built out based on so many other documents we have and measurables are not. Um, any other thoughts, comments on comprehensive housing policy? Seeing none, we already did general public comment. Um, I don't have any announcements other than I'm at this point, unless some big surprise comes between now and or after the December 16th council meeting um, or 21st council meeting or something, I don't plan on having that meeting on the 27th or whatever day it would be, the 29th. Um, We've got a handle on our work. We're moving along. We don't need to meet between Christmas and New Year's. So, you know, unless something gets referred to us that has to be done before that January meeting, that first meeting in January at the council, I am intending to cancel that meeting. The only thing I wouldn't is if we get something referred to us and they're like, and it needs back by January 5th. <laughs> and then we gotta have the meeting. Um, so that's my only announcement uh next agenda you've pretty much heard the preview in january we'll deal with a calendar i think we have meetings scheduled through mid-january or the end of january uh i don't have anything unanticipated are there any announcements or unanticipated items from the members seeing none i am then going to adjourn the meeting at 4 4 p.m thank you all great work today thank you lindsay